So my part of this project is to look at the chemical and physical parameters. And so on your sheet, page number eight, I've listed the different parameters that uh, I've been measuring, and those include soil nitrate, Olson phosphorus for chemical parameters, water, penetration resistance, which measures compaction, wet aggregate stability, so essentially how stable are our aggregates, soil that's clumped together when exposed to water, because that really affects our erosion potential. It also affects things like infiltration. And finally, temperature, which are measured with these small little buttons, about the size of three stacked nickels together, which are about two inches below the ground surface in uh, about two thirds of these plots behind me. So what have we found? We found that Olson phosphorus in the top six inches does not differ among three of our major treatments, fallow, pea, and our six species mix here at this study. So after one cycle, we did not see differences in available phosphorus. The second point there is we did not see any differences in the top six inches for penetration resistance, which is a measure of compaction. We did see lower penetration resistance in our fallow soils below six inches, but we're pretty sure that's because those soils are moister. And one problem with penetration resistance is if the soil is wetter, it's, it's easier to push a probe through. So when you measure compaction or penetration resistance, you really need to start at the exact same soil water content. We don't always have that here in the field. I have two graphs showing soil nitrate in the top three feet measured at this location and in the top two feet measured at Dutton, so about 20 miles to our south here. That top graph, we're comparing fallow, pea, and our six species mix, meaning the eight, the eight species mix minus our fibrous rooted species. That was one that wasn't full of downy brome out here because we were able to spray out the grasses with a grassy herbicide. On the vertical axis there, we have nitrate in pounds of nitrogen per acre. So one thing you can see is that the nitrate following fallow was about 20 pounds more than following either pea or our six species mix. So uh, wheat, <coughs> when it, spring wheat went into that Conrad site with somewhat less nitrate than um, following our mixes than following fallow. And sometimes we see that in decreased protein or decreased yield. What happened, so this was right after that Conrad graph, the top graph there was right after terminating our cover crop. In some ways, that doesn't matter that much to the next crop. What matters is the following spring. On March 12th, 2013, at this site, we found 72 pounds of nitrogen per acre following fallow and 49 pounds of nitrogen per acre following pea. So a question for you guys is why do you think that pea treatment didn't release more nitrate than fallow when we know that pea was fixing probably quite a bit of nitrogen. Probably because part of the reason is it, it used quite a bit, yep, and so it started it started with less nitrogen, but then it, it kind of kept that same, that same distance. Why do you think that pea didn't release more? Think about climate and think about that 2012, 2013 winter and early spring. The weather records show that that was a pretty dry fall, winter, early spring. It didn't really start raining till May. And so I think that pea residue could have broken down, but there, there might just not have been enough warmth and moisture at the same time. Sometimes we see pea catch up a little closer to fallow than we did at this site. The lower graph there shows Dutton uh, post-termination, and there again we found more nitrate following fallow than following either the pea or full species mix. Uh, the, the same letter there on pea and full species mix means that there wasn't, wasn't a difference. And so we're growing more species, but we did not use up more nitrate than following pea. Pea didn't leave more nitrate than following the full species mix. So this was data. We, we were collecting data about every two hours out here. Perry went through to try to simplify things, and he pulled out just the temperatures at 4 p.m. Our thought was, let's look at just the hottest temperature for the day and see if these cover crops really affect temperature. We have dates there along the horizontal axis and temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the vertical axis. 
uh, I don't have the, the emergence date on here, but you can kind of guess that where these graphs separate between fallow and mixed cover crops is about where we started getting uh, some substantial leaf production and started shading that soil. Note that by about the time we terminated these crops, which was mid to uh, around mid-July, there was a separation of about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Fallow is about 15 degrees warmer at two inches down than uh, under a, a number of our different cover crops. So these cover crops are really cooling the soil. Then notice that they come back together by August, but there's still a substantial time where they're separated. Note that the two coolest mixes they were cool all the way into early August where the nitrogen fixers are P. This is a quiz to see who is paying attention to Perry's talk. Why do you think those two cooled the soil longer than the others? Yeah, they didn't die. So we think that's that's a, a big reason for the those differences there. Why do you think um, these temperature differences might be important? We don't we don't really know, but any guesses on why temperature um, these large temperature differences in the afternoon might matter? Water use, certainly with higher temperatures, we're gonna have more evaporation from those from the fallow. What else? Yeah, that's something we don't know. Maybe maybe it gets hot enough right there on the surface that we're actually killing some some microbes. On the other hand, when temperatures are cool, maybe that warming is is helping the microbes. So that's something that we still need to sleuth out. We know temperature matters. We know temperature is different. Uh, we're not exactly sure uh, how it matters, and that's something we hopefully will figure out. So four take-home messages of this study that um, I, I put together there at the bottom. Cover crops likely do not significantly increase crop yield or soil quality when only grown once. There's just simply not enough time or enough biomass produced. Cover crops have been shown to benefit the next crop and economic return when grown for at least three cycles, meaning cover crop, then a, a crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop. So that's what Perry and others in the region have found both in Canada and in Northeast Montana. Cover crop cocktails have the potential to grow more biomass than single species or two species mixes. And please do stay tuned because soil health changes are likely cumulative. And so each year I think we're going to learn a little bit more. If you do want to know more about cover crops, you can go to my webpage, which is listed here. There's presentations on cover crops. Uh, there's links, there's videos that you can go to, or always feel free to give me a call or send me an email.